So we're just chatting here with uh, Gary Pearson, the famous Gary Pearson. Here he is. <laughs> so I'm just thinking, uh, Gary, how would you answer the question of the first stirring of the Holy Spirit in your life? The first, your first experience of, of I guess, God speaking. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I can think of some times that, like, uh, from before I actually had a, a major encounter with God where my mum as a parent would just leave the Bible beside my bed as a young child. And I would, All right. Okay. Yeah, and I would, I would open it up and I would just begin to read it, but I was always led to First John. That was my favourite chapter in the Bible. Okay. And I would, and I would always uh, just read it and read it and read, I'd read the Gospels. I try and read Revelation because as a young kid, it sounded dramatic and there was dragons and there was this and there was yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And it was exciting. So I, I would say they were the first stirrings of the Holy Spirit in my life where I didn't really, I didn't really realize until I actually became born again and, and got spirit filled that you see the, the, the handprint or the, the, the hand of God in your life from an early age. Like a know? thread. Like, so was your, was your mum a believer? She was. I mean, my biological mum was a Catholic and um, I was actually given up for adoption at a very early age of like six months old. Right. But my adopted mum very much was in the faith. Um, she, she didn't so much go to church as a church goer, but she would do a lot of work with the church. She would, okay. you know, do a lot of things helping out. And uh, yeah, so her exampleship, because one of the things I learned when she passed away was, she didn't preach Christ to me with her words. She preached yeah. Christ to me with her lifestyle. And that really impacted me once she passed away. And I, and I saw that and I was like, wow, look at that. She really exemplified the love of Christ, the peace of Christ in her, in her lifestyle. Mm -hmm. That impacted me more than her saying, you know, you must go to church or you must do this or you must do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was powerful. So it's something that you experienced through an authentic lifestyle rather than through religious practices yeah, as such yeah, very good very good yeah and so when you so you're sitting there did you kind of see the bible like a magic book you know you, you she, she gives you the bible she pops it down by the, the side of your bed were you sort of like uh... <laughs> <laughs> so what, what well, I, mean, I mean i didn't i didn't i didn't really see it as a perhaps a magic book but it did speak to me of like creation, how creation came about, because it was only really sections that I would read because as a young kid, some of it really you couldn't kind of get your head around it. So maybe Genesis I would read, the Gospels I would read, and I was always led to First John for some reason. I think it was because it was so close to Revelation. And then Revelation, <laughs> I would... the, bit, the bit before, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just a bit before. That's, that's so a fascinating started... thought. I mean, you can understand it like Genesis and the Gospels because they're like stories that, you know, and then stories are easy to read. And, you know, when you get to those genealogies, you tend to, the, the telephone directories always slow you down a little bit. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, but one John is interesting because it's all about authentic lifestyle experience, just like your mum was, was, was exemplifying for you, which is yeah yeah this is you know you can't love god and hate your brother you know that's really uh key isn't it in one john that sort of expression yeah so that they were like the foundations that helped me later on in life because a lot of things happened in my teen years which were quite you know destructive and quite had a, a massive effect on me Mm -hmm. um which caused me to go off off path you know i started off as this you know top of the class young boy you know everything was going well and then it hit the age of 14 and things veered off into a direction that was just off key you know it was it was dr drugs it was smoking it was drinking it was you know not going to school things just spiraled out of control mm -hmm. and um I found myself as a teenager just really you know, um, heading towards jail, heading towards homelessness. You know, what, even, a, even as a young teenager? Yeah, as a young teenager. I mean, I was kicked out of the family home at the age of 16 because my, my um, behaviour was so bad 
uh, that they didn't trust me in the house. You know, that's were, were you violent or were you were you violent or were you like stealing? I wouldn't say I was violent, but I was definitely stealing from the house to 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 feed my habit of drug addiction um, and things. You know, and that kind of. So my dad was just like he'd had enough. Um, you know, his tools would go missing, or you know, think money would go missing in the house, and and and. and and so it, to, to protect themselves, it was like, right, you're 16 now, you know, we'll hand you over to social services or you can go be in a hostel or you can go somewhere else, anywhere but the house, you know. How do you feel yourself about that? Did you feel betrayed by them or did you feel, no, that's reasonable? Well, I, I kind of was sad about it, but at the same time, I understood they were doing the best for their own um, self-preservation, as it were, because obviously... Yeah things that were of, of value to them mm. I was just taking and, and selling and using for my own uh, selfish gain really so mm -hmm. I mm. did understand it but at the time I was just I kind of almost happy to get out of the house and go yeah. and have, be in a hostel and party and do all these things yeah. So, uh, yeah so what age did you you left school at 16 then really yeah I left school at 16 my grades were amazing I think the highest the highest I got was a C in French, which I have absolutely no use for at the moment. Um, so that wasn't very good. And then um, I just spent the next probably three years up until my uh, experience with God, just going spiraling down and down and down. Um, you know, every hostel I would go in, I would never pay any rent because obviously I was an addict. So I would jump from one hostel to the next hostel to the next hostel until at the age of just getting on for 17 and a half, I would, I'd spent, you know, I'd started then being homeless on the streets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't in jail, you know, the, the police would be catching up with me for different crimes of burglary and <clears throat> stealing things and uh, deceptions with these sponsor farms going around with a sponsor farm trying to collect money um, deceptively. But you know, this was my lifestyle at the time. And um, so then I'd spend a little bit of time in jail. I'd come back out to the streets. And I think I remember close to the age of 18, I was um, then um, what you call put into a psychiatric ward because I'd, I'd had a meeting with a mental health nurse and she was just like so, so shocked at this this young man at such a, an early age of his life being tangled up in all these uh, issues that I would end up there for a short period of time then I would come out try and get myself back on track but then things would soon fall through again right but, right yeah. so you packed a lot in you packed a lot into <laughs> being 18 years old yeah I mean my, my t I think from the age of 14 to 19 them teenage years five years were just filled with <clears throat> chaos chaos crime um madness yeah and right. then came the golden the golden moment at the age of 19 and a half i just got out of a meeting with my psych psychiatric nurse and i was begging her to take me back in because at the time i was on the streets and i said look i don't want to do the drugs anymore i don't want to do the crime anymore i come to a place where i was just fed up and um, just really looking for answers, really looking for a way out. <clears throat> and I was begging, I said, look, please take me back into the psychiatric ward. I just, you know, no one will take me in. I've got nowhere to live. I don't want to do the drugs. I've come to the end of myself. And um, she said, I'm sorry, Gary, you don't fit the criteria anymore. We can't help you. And I said, what do I have to do? Do I have to cut myself? Do I have to smash the place to pieces? What's it going to take? And they said, I'm sorry, Gary, you know, we can't help you. And I left that place. <clears throat> with a decision that I was going to take my own life mm -hmm. and when I left that place I'd, I'd made up in my mind I said I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to end my life this is it for me it's the end <clears throat> and on my way to go and commit suicide I was walking past Manchester Cathedral and this thought entered into my mind of if I took my life would I go to heaven or would I go to hell Mm -hmm. And as that thought pricked my conscience, I got angry with God. I got angry. There was this anger that rose up of, you know, if you are real, why is my life like this? If you are real, what's it all about? And so I stormed into Manchester Cathedral. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I stormed into Manchester Cathedral at the time, um, you know, and I just had it out with God. I went to where I thought God was. I went to the altar and I, 
I didn't know how to pray. I just, I just said, God, I don't believe in you. I was being real. I said, God, I don't believe in you. Jesus, I don't believe in you. But if you're real, you need to come right now. I said, because I'm at the end of my life and I'm going to take my life and I'm going to kill myself. And when I heard them words and I actually heard myself saying I was going to take my own life, it broke me. Mm -hmm. I fell to my knees and I began to sob my heart out and cry my heart out. And I just spent a good five, ten minutes there crying every tear I could possibly cry. And then a silence, a peace like I've never known before. You could hear a pin drop. It was just a stillness. And I heard these words. Yes. I am your God, and you are my child. Now go, and it shall be done. And I kind of looked around, wow, you know, thinking, who's there? You know, who said that? But then I knew the authority of those words, and I, I knew that <laughs> it was something supernatural. And so I got up and I wiped my tears and I did what the voice told me to do. I left, I, I went, and I opened the door. And as I opened the door, two evangelists or two men, which I now know to be evangelists, two men stood there at the end of the path. And there was something about them. There was a glow. There was a shine. There was something that attracted me to go and speak to them. And so I walked up to them and I said, uh, hi. I said, you don't know me. I said, my name's Gary. I said, uh, I said I'm, I've been an addict for years. I said, I'm lost. I said, I'm tired. I said, I was going to take my life today. And they looked at each other and smiled. And they looked at me and smiled because in their prayer time that morning, God had spoke to them and said, you need to be here at this moment, at this wow. time. And they began to preach the gospel to me. They began to share the, the, the news of Jesus Christ and began to tell me that, listen, that God is real. He's got a plan for your life. And it was from that moment they said, listen, we know a place we can take you to. It's a Christian recovery home. But before we get into all of that, they said, do you know Jesus Christ? I said, I said, I want to know him. I said, I've tried everything else. I said, what do I have to do? And he said, listen, say this prayer, you know, and, and ask Christ into your life. I said, well, I've tried. You know, I've tried everything else. I'm willing, I'm ready. And that was the first time I asked Christ into my life. And then from there, my journey began. I went to the Christian recovery home and I, you know, began to seek the Lord and pray and learn how to pray and learn how to read the word. And that's where my journey began all them years ago, 20 years ago. Golly, that's so dramatic, isn't it? What about the thread? What about the thread? Is is there, I mean, you said like, here you are at a boy and you've got this Bible by the side of your bed and you recognize even to this day that there are, there are moments in the Bible that really spoke to you and that you kept going back to, even being teased by Revelation and really enjoying one John. They're fascinating little thoughts. And then, then you've got this kind of barren period and uh, like a period of pain and, and you, you described it as chaos, like the yeah. chaos and madness. And then you, you come to yourself at the end of it. It's, it's almost like the sort of prodigal son type of story, isn't it? And yeah. he was told, you know, you know, you know he, he goes a long, long way away. And then he, 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 finds, he, he finds his way home. He finds his way home. Yeah. yeah, that's that's so. But is there a thread that, that goes through the middle? Was there a consciousness when you're in the worst part of your chaos that, you know, did you call out on God then? I, I remember <clears throat> specifically one night I'd been homeless walking for hours and hours and I'd walked to the hospital and um, I remember I'd found somewhere to try and get my head to sleep, but I, I cried out to God. I mean, I, I said, look, I want to know the truth. I remember this prayer specifically, and I just said, what is it all about? What is life yeah. all about? I want to know the truth. I want to know the truth. Hmm. But it can't have been maybe a week or two later when I had this, obviously, experience. Yeah, yeah. Think, okay. I answered the prayer, you know? So there were little hints and moments. Yeah, but and And what do you think? Do you think God was hiding himself for, for a while? <laughs> i mean you know we we have this idea of god uh who is like watching and protecting you know and 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 caring and yet we both know people who have not experienced that and people who whose lives are just well i guess the picture of the chaos isn't it the, the picture of that yeah. chaos you, you know like you're sort of saying, well, where is God? Where is God in the mess? What would you say to somebody who said that to you now? Well, I mean, I remember times looking back when I was on the streets and I had no food, when I had no money, even at Christmas, 
strangers would just like the love of God would just like be giving me money to get a hotel room or the food would come from nowhere or provision would come supernaturally. And I'd be like, there must be someone looking out for me. Is that right? You actually vocalised that. You actually made that kind of little mental yeah, assessment. I made, I, okay. I made that as, as if like something somewhere is loving me because I'm here, I'm broken, I'm homeless. And in, 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 the, in the emptiness of it all, provisions were coming supernaturally through strangers or through one way or another doors were opening and it was like it could, now you see it <laughs> you have the revelation you go ah i see god i yeah, see yeah, you yeah. working in the past i see you working behind the scenes yeah 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 yeah, yeah that's right so, that's what i meant when i used the word thread you know when when you look back you can you, you see things in a in, in a in a different way but of course your 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 story has made you uh who you are today and has also prepared you for all the the work that you do in in similar kind of areas so when you're dealing with people in in the in the kind of chaos in in the chaos do you see yourself or do you kind of remember yourself <laughs> yeah. i mean that's what draws me the most you know that's what touches my heart because i've been i've been where they are sat yeah. where they've sat you know that's, it. And, that's, uh, it. that's what really um fuels my my passion to want to be able to because i know there's hope and when you see them in that yeah. place where they feel there's no hope and they sense there's no or they, they, you see their faces and you feel the pain you can you can um, understand the pain and just being able to tell them that there's hope and tell them that there's a way out you know because i've experienced it myself you know, you you you're drawn to tell them. You want to tell them. You have a passion for them. But they say at the same time, you you understand what they're going through. You understand how they feel. You understand their loneliness and their brokenness. And um, mm. yeah. Just... And also, you you got the the, the picture, the the two sided picture of the the evangelist. He, he he, this guy comes along, or the two 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 fellows that you meet there outside the cathedral. Mm. They come along, but they they don't just tell you the good news about God. They don't just tell you about God's love. They also say, we know a recovery center. We know a Christian recovery center. So they have like a kind of a spiritual and a, a practical piece of good news for you. And and the well, two of them, the two of them are going together. Yeah. Well, the beautiful thing about that was when they took me to the recovery home, the director was away in London for a few days. So his wife said, well, we can't take him now, but if you come back in a couple of days, we'll, we'll definitely be able to take him in. And they took me into their own home. They uh -huh. fed me, they clothed me, they prayed for me. I just remember, um, you know, drifting in and out of sleep. And I remember someone there and I could hear them praying in tongues and they were praying over me, praying over me, praying over me. I just remember that atmosphere of just prayer and the spirit of God. And then they took me out on the streets when they were handing out tracks. And so they kept me close with them for them two days and really prayed over my life before they took me to the Christian uh, recovery home. So that's the third step, isn't it? That That's and really the good. Samaritan. They showed me the good Samaritan. You know, yeah, and... yeah. But, but it was yeah. certainly it had to be done you know they, they wanted to feed your your spirit like give, giving you this news but they also wanted to protect you pr protect you from yourself i guess yeah yeah they really followed through it wasn't just um a, a, a shallow or surface kind of god bless you jesus loves you see you later kind of thing yeah. it was a real follow through hey god really loves you and god's got a plan for you and in fact we're going to do all we can to to not only point to, to the direction we're going to carry you there wow that is a good word yeah yeah <laughs> no it made me think of the you know when the guys lower the guy on the stretcher and put him at, at, at jesus's feet it's That's like right. it's when jesus saw their faith he saw that he didn't see the, the guy in the stretch he didn't have any faith but he saw their faith you know That's and may, maybe right, yeah. Yeah, so you were you were incapable of bringing yourself so they brought you they yeah, brought so you. they made sure that i got to the destination they ripped open that roof they did whatever it took <laughs> to get me. that's wonderful well let's let's just uh pause there and then in the next in, in the next podcast we'll just take it a little bit further and just think about what 
what this means about like, like a kind of a thread in your life year at a time of chaos and then god's kind of strategic moments but then it's it's got to be tailored to the individual hasn't it mm. I'm, i feel like i'm turning into an evangelism lecturer so <laughs> but this is real life you know it's, mm. it's got to be spiritual help it's got to be practical help you like like when mm. when it says there's no point saying god bless you if somebody's hungry you know feed them feed them. yeah yeah Absolutely. i think well, from the next steps on in the, in the next podcast it's really about them me wrestling with god because then God's okay. got to wrestle with all this, this young boy. And the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And to unravel it all, you know. So, the unraveling. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, bless you, brother. And it's uh, good to talk to you. And we'll we'll follow we'll follow the story through next time. All right. Amen. All right. Amen.